help out. The middle school ended their Saturday with the stakeout. Um, FFA hosted, the middle school FFA chapter hosted, it was kind of like the lock late. It was, they did a bunch of activities um, for the FFA, the middle school chapter. Um, and last week they, they, they held Green Hand and Discovery Week, which included lots of activities for the freshmen and eighth graders. Our advanced vet science students competed at a virtual vet science contest held by the Texas A&M. They were 17th out of all schools from all over the country. Um, and our freshman creed speakers will be competing at a public contact virtually held by Tarlington University the first week of November on Zoom. Uh, Coach Hill for volleyball. She said, uh, we are in our final push for the season. We have struggled in this season with consistency, but as far as I am concerned, it is everyone's, it is anyone's game next week at regionals. They will have their final home match this Friday against Buffalo, and then they will head to Douglas and wrap up their final match for the regular season. Uh, she said that our freshman and JV teams are, have shown great improvement this season. Varsity is still showing improvement and has been playing right with most of the teams. We just need to get past the point where we are playing not to lose and we begin to play to win. Cheer, Coach Huckbelt. She said, the cheer team has two fundraisers this fall. The first one was window painting, decorating, business in the community for homecoming week. The second fundraiser was the K-8 cheer camp. Uh, the participants learned two cheers in, and a dance during a 2.5 hour clinic on Saturday morning and they all performed at the home football game this past Friday. Uh, they all have, they have cheered at all of their home football games uh, this fall season and their fall season is coming to an end and they plan on more fundraisers during during the winter season to to include a raffle for Bobcat's cornhole set. Uh, winter is a comp competitive season so they will begin preparing for state competition as well as cheering for girls and boys home basketball games and home wrestling. And that is it. Nice. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. It was a good report. Okay, time to move on to district chair. Madam Chair, we're going to lead off with Mrs. Daniels, but we have several admin that will jump in for district chair. I will be talking about uh, what they've done to bridge gaps on essential learnings and uh, with the uh, pause last year for COVID-19. Mrs. Daniels. Oh, nice. Well, it's a good night to share with all the celebrations. And what I want to share kind of ties in with everything we've been hearing tonight. Uh, the model PLC piece of the middle school and Mrs. K's award and all the great things going on in our district and I just think that um, I'm not sure how much you're aware of the fact that we're working really hard to put a lot of that information out to other folks not just in our community or in our district uh, the all things PLC magazine has an article in the summer issue the summer 2020 issue about the work we're doing in our district and then it includes a, a caption piece at the back by Emmy Herbert um, why I love PLCs more or why I love PLCs more than numbers and so there's uh, just a lot of things going on in our district that we're trying to share out and uh, get out in the research realm of education because somebody's doing the research and it might as well be us we have a lot of positive things happening we are a, a small rural school and that is a unique niche for us as far as um, the work that we're doing and how we've taken the work that is largely urban and put it into a lot of singleton teacher roles. Well, how do we collaborate when there are so many singletons in our district and what does that look like? Um, the other piece of that is that this, oh, I don't know, in the last couple months, I worked with all Things PLC Solution Tree to put together an article, a case study, about our programs and how we are how we are basically navigating the COVID-19 piece. So that case study will go into the winter issue of All Things PLC 
and it's it's more of a district-wide perspective uh, because the admin team works together, we share our data together, we all have that access to that data. It's a lot about what I want to visit tonight. The other admin are going to visit tonight about our tiered intervention system and how we've applied our tiered intervention system to that COVID-19 gap. We've got students out of school for five months. And so the case study is how we're addressing that five month gap and what that looks like, how it's impacting students, kind of what some of the what are some of the pieces we're starting to see this fall that had, what we noticed that did impact student learning and then how much may, mainly that we're just moving forward, mm -hmm. um, that we're able to just continue to move forward. So the article is just, I, I felt it was important for you to kind of see that a lot of what's happening in our district is being shared out in a, to a bigger, broader audience. And I wanted you to be aware of that. It's, I, you know, I, I don't know if the community is aware of that, but things that are happening in our school, the information that our admin team works together on and how we share that with each other, a lot of that is being shared out to a, to a bigger audience. Um, I was named a Solution Tree Associate in July, and so that is something I'm very excited about to get to go out and do professional development um, with other districts and share the strategies that we're seeing in our district that are working. And so those types of things are, I don't know, it's kind of unique and kind of fun to, to be able to get out and share those things. So I wanted you to be aware of that. The tiered intervention system, which is the part of what the case study is about and has been a part of our district for a long time, has really come into effect with the COVID-19 five-month gap. So with that gap, we have to look at what are we doing when students come back to us in the fall, how are we going to address that gap, and how big is the gap really? I mean, I think that was our one of our bigger questions is, um, who is it impacting, how much is it impacting our students, and then what are we going to do about it? So all teams collected data. You know, you saw our data presentations in June from all the administrators. Um, then this fall, we've all been collecting our own data, kind of that comparison of where were we at in the winter and, and in the spring, and now where are we at here in the fall. And as we're looking at that, um, we see different gaps in different places, different grade levels, um, but we also notice that some of it isn't as, as big as maybe what people thought or, or might have predicted. Um, our tiered intervention system, which we use all the time, not just at, at this time with COVID, has really allowed us to address the gaps that we are finding. Uh, I put together like what does it look like at the high school at tier one, and that tier one is the green um, on this on this chart. Tier one is everybody. All students can access tier one supports. Mm -hmm. They're not a punishment. Um, all students can be part of that. And so those tier one supports are for everyone. The tier two supports are kind of those next level supports. If tier one's not working, it's not meeting your needs, what are we going to do in tier two? And then tier three is that uh, specialized support and instruction. A lot of that involves special education or a 504 or something like that. So there, the tiers are, are in use. We've been using them for several years, but then with the COVID piece, um, we really had to kind of drill down into what students were missing during that five, that from March through May, which extended into the summer, created kind of that five month gap. One thing that we're noticing at the high school is uh, students probably had their biggest hit in math at the high school level. Math has been probably one of our bigger challenges. Uh, they just didn't retain it with that, uh, that five month gap. And so how, how are we going to get them back to where they were like back in February? And so we're seeing a gap there more in math than like in English. English is pretty level and steady. Um, science took a pretty deep hit, um, but reading did not. So as we look at kind of those four core areas, we're evaluating that data and looking at student by student at who might be missing some essential pieces. When you look at our tiered interventions, I wanted to kind of draw your attention to a couple that I don't know, I've definitely had some questions asked of me about them. I, I meet with students and sometimes they're frustrated about how we're using some of the tiers because it interrupts what they would consider their time. Um, but like when you look at lunchtime intervention, that first um, tiered intervention, lunchtime intervention is our reaction when a student is missing work and what would typically in an old school type of environment be a zero in the grade book. 
So instead of putting, well, we still put the zero there often as a placeholder, but instead of leaving that zero there, the student has LTI, they have a lunchtime intervention. They owe that time even if they get the work done before the LTI happens. So if I am in first period and I don't have my work done that day, uh, the teacher goes into the database and enters my name for an LTI, even if I get that work done by noon, I still owe the time. And the main reason for that is because it's been a pretty big inconvenience to the teacher. They've had, they've collected their work, they've already, you know, went into the database and entered your name, and now you're saying, well, I have it done, I have it done. Well, you still owe the time. Mm -hmm. And you can work on anything you want during that lunchtime intervention, but you still owe the time because you didn't have your work done on time. And in some schools, those would have just been zeros that would not have been taken back out of the grade book. Um, or they would have been maybe a deduction in points, which we really try not to do. So those types of things, sometimes I you know, have to meet with students and talk to them about that. Um, the win time is from 325 to 350, and our community is getting used to that. Our students are getting used to it. But one of the things I still struggle with is our school day runs from 820 to 350. And sometimes kids who aren't pulled very often for win, um, because teachers put their name in a spreadsheet, a student goes to advisory at 320, and then they're told by their advisor every single day whether or not they've been pulled or asked for by a teacher, requested by a teacher. And so er they don't know until that day. They don't know until that day at 320 whether or not they've been requested. And some, you know, some students don't get pulled very often. They don't get requested very, very often. And then when they do, they might have already maybe had a plan in their head of what they were going to do at 3.30 that day, right? Mm -hmm. And so they, they want to still do their plan, whatever that is, and now they can't. And one of the conversations I often have to have is, our school day doesn't end until 3.50. So every day we own that time until we tell you mm -hmm. that we don't need you. And so that's that's kind of a that's a hard thing to understand, especially if you're not requested very often as a student. Um, stu some students get into that rhythm and they really um, like accessing that time. Some students kind of push back against that time. Like I'd really like that time to be my own every day. So we really we just have to keep reinforcing that when time is is an essential thing. If you're requested, it's also an opportunity. If you need to meet up with the teacher, the teachers are in their rooms and ready to meet with you. One thing that we did that was unique to COVID um, was our Friday academic blocks. We have the three blocks on Friday, three 45 minute blocks, the ABC. And it's the same thing, we have a spreadsheet, teachers put students' names into the spreadsheet and request them. And then if students not requested for a block, they can choose an enrichment instead. Um, one thing about COVID is it's really limited our enrichments. They're definitely not as, we don't have the guest speakers and we just don't have as many opportunities with our school the way it is right now with COVID. But um, if a student is requested for a block, then th they have to go. If, if, if their teacher requests them, they, they must go. They don't get to choose an enrichment that hour. One of the things we did with COVID was we looked at students that were maybe, not maybe, but students that did miss essential learnings in March through May. They didn't participate in a learning unit. They maybe didn't um, turn in a big assignment during that time period. We gave a lot of grace with grades during that time because we couldn't access the kids the way we wanted to. We didn't feel like we could um, communicate with them as much as we would like to. So we gave a lot of grace with grades, but at the same time we identified those students and said, you missed this unit of instruction. We're going to pull you on A block for a series of three to six Fridays and you're going to complete that unit, even though you've already had that class, and even though you already have a grade in that class. And that was hard for some students. They felt like they were over and done with that class, the grade was in the grade book, but we were looking at mainly our math, English, and science. We just looked at those three core areas, and we looked at kids that might have significant learning gaps that would, um, it would make it harder to transition to the next course if they didn't have those skills. And so we pulled them into those Friday blocks, not for a grade, but just for the learning. And so it was participation based, we need you there, you're requested there. And there were some students that were, were a little bit resistant to that. They felt like they had completed that course, um, why do I need to go back? 
and we just said, you, you know, we consider this essential learning, that's what we call it, essential learning, and we need you to be there and in those classes. And so they had a series of blocks that we're kind of phasing those out, we're getting done with those, we've, we've had all, you know, nine weeks here in the fall, but we did request students for those series of blocks. So that, that's part of our intervention system. Um, we also have some pretty unique enrichments, um, like I said, less this year than we have in the past, but one that really stands out to me is our vet science with, um, with Britton Van Hewley, um, Jake Chalupka, who has a vet science background, our math teacher, and then Dr. Dickey. He's coming in on Fridays and doing a series of vet science courses in that C block, and he did that for us last year as well. Our students have been in some competitions and things like that with vet science. So we, this year, definitely not the quality or level of enrichments we would like to have, but still trying to get some of those in there for students. Um, Mr. McBee took students bike riding as an enrichment last week, and I mean, there's just different ones every week. Um, but anyway, that's part of what that looks like. And so I just, I wanted you to be aware, I think, um, the, that we all, maybe um, know that these exist and that our students have these opportunities, but what does it look like and how does it fall into the tiered interventions? Uh, at the end of about seven weeks, I looked at math grades and students that had had three or four weeks of Fs in math, uh, we looked at their uh, the scores and we made a decision to put them in, keep them in their regular math class, but also put them in an additional math intervention class which we hadn't had for a year or so. We added that back into our schedule, pull, changed their schedules and put them so that they're double blocked, regular math and math interventions to support the learning that was missing those skill gaps. So those are things that are happening at the high school. Um, all of those things you're pretty familiar with. We've had um, presentations on a lot of them, the different pieces, the SIT process and the sources of strength that our alternative classroom and all of those pieces. But this is how it all ties together. And what you'll hear from the other admin is that you'll see these things happening in K-12 across the buildings. We're using these tiered interventions and this system of interventions and then using our data to support how we use these for individual students. Thanks. One of the things, Madam Chair, that I think is about Mrs. Daniels and her work with their essential learnings is it's a little more uh, community visible, if I would call it that way, because in our other buildings, it may not sound like it's from another course from a previous time uh, nearly as much. So mm -hmm. I think it's more visible at our high school work and share in their football field. Thanks, Mrs. Daniels. Uh -huh. So this is going to look very similar to what you just saw from Mrs. Daniels. One thing I'm going to point out, though, I, I had to use it. Um, you're going to, if you flip it over to the back, there's a little pyramid. I got that from well, these three ladies. They've helped me out more than I could ever ever say. But this came from um, Mrs. Ryan, some work that we did together on the MTSS system. We've been using it at the, at the middle school. But what that is, like, it, it explains, it breaks it down for me. When I was at the previous district that I was at for several years, I didn't know what PLC was. I didn't know what MTSS was. I didn't know what interventions were. Right? It's something that we have been working to do very well in this district, and I, I've had to learn about it. So if you see Tier 1, that's like, as Mrs. Daniel said, that's something that all kids get. The way I think about Tier 2 is it's smaller group, and whether it is um, a specific skill or whatever, if it, it's a group of probably more than 10, it's probably a Tier 2 intervention whether it's with the teacher, their individual teacher, or it could be with the teacher they don't even have, and it still be a tier two intervention. And then tier three is gonna be something that's student by student, skill by skill, probably one-on-one, -on -one, maybe up to a group of three working on something very specific. So as you look through this, if you flip it back over tier one, two, and three for the middle school, that's what those things are. And th this is, it's a little bit misleading, and the reason for that is, we kind of have two different schools going on in the middle school. You know, our fifth and sixth grade, it's like a little elementary school. It's like a, it's a good transition over two years. A little bit less so as a sixth grader and more like a middle schooler, but it's a completely different world than our seventh and eighth grade students. You know, it's a big transition from sixth to seventh grade. And for me to say every kid uses workshop every day is misleading. We have math teachers that use it in the seventh grade classroom in their daily schedule. They get the workshop to work on their skills. We have uh, fifth and sixth graders that have workshop every single afternoon to work on specific skills that they need for those days. The teachers have 
preference to pull and work on those specific skills for English or math or whatever. So as you look through tier one, required flex and workshop times, every student gets that. It just doesn't look the same from fifth, sixth, seventh, or eighth grade, right? Um, the fr required Friday cores, all of them are gonna see their core teachers every Friday. Our fifth grade, they have their Friday schedule that they go through. They go through their same core blocks. Our seventh and eighth graders, it doesn't look in that exact same way, but they're still gonna get the access to those cores. Um, IXL, get more math, read by just words. If you flip that sheet back over, those can be used as interventions or enrichments, as Mrs. Daniels was talking about. If they have a kid that has mastered these five skills, a lot of our teachers, most of our teachers use those teaching like a champion strategies to post all of their, their assignments, all of what their, their targets on the board, right? Well, when those students have met those targets, every, every teacher we have that has access to those applications right there, a lot of times is IXL, will have the enrichment IXL standards for a student that is finished with their work to extend on their learning when they're done. And it's something that our teachers do really well. So it can be, all of those can be used for an intervention or an enrichment, depending on the time of day. Um, you're gonna notice voluntary AO, academic opportunity. We have two teachers that are really good about that. That's a tier two or a tier one intervention if they volunteer. They're in a big group, they're working on something specific. It might just be getting ahead for the next day. But when they're assigned and they got something specific to work on with a bigger group, that's what makes it a tier two intervention. Um, you can go through you know, the cap time. That's something that our teachers were really doing, but we just weren't tracking it. So we started tracking it. Um, CAT stands for content area tutor tutoring. You might have a science teacher that pulls that specific kid into their classroom and works on one specific skill or with a group up to five or ten, whatever it can be. And what we kind of found using these things, I'll get in some, some tier three here in a second, is when we came back from COVID, the COVID closure, our teachers sat down and they went through their curriculum and what they had actually taught and where they thought the gaps might be. And almost all of our teachers, I think save for one, had went through all of their essential learnings. They had taught them. They just hadn't got back to spiral the learning. We missed that fourth quarter, and a lot of our teachers, they used that whole fourth quarter to spiral. So it wasn't necessarily that they weren't exposed. They just didn't get to review it. So we spent the first two or three weeks using the flex time, the workshops, the Friday cores, that kind of stuff to spiral and see where kids were. And then we just kind of, we just kind of went from there. You know, there wasn't, we didn't see the big, huge gaps like the experts were predicting. I think, like on map, it's a seven points is a year. Is that what it is? So seven points is a year. We had one group that grew by 15 points between winter and fall. So, you know, we just didn't see what the experts were saying. We, there were some gaps, but we were able to recover and move on quicker than, we, you know, the experts had predicted. So our teachers did a really good job with that stuff. There are a select few students that need those tier three interventions. So we haven't had to place anybody in an alternative classroom. We have had to use text-to-speech. We had, have had to use individual read live. And, and Mrs. Daniels was saying with the high schoolers, it's more math and science. Reading was where we lost a few of our younger kids. Seventh and eighth graders, they're readers. It's just practice and refining those skills. Um, for our fifth and sixth graders, there's a few of them that, that they really needed that intensive, uh, intensive read live work with a you know, a reading specialist and with our English teachers because they are master teachers and they would work with them. Um, and once our, we have a lot of coaches in our building, so once those fall, those fall sports were over, they've been pulling them to use cat time, just one-on-one -on -one skills after school. So uh, Mrs. Darabini calls it a double dip. They will get them in class, they'll dip again, you know, in specials or when they can get them during the interventions during the day, and then we have them pulling them again after school to get those skills all caught up. So, you know, it's just it's just using the intervention systems that we already have. And Mrs. Daniels did an amazing job building them in for the last, you know, seven or eight years. Um, and it's just using those, making sure that everybody's on the same page, that they are sy systematic, and, and getting the kids back where they need to be. Um, I really do believe our, our teachers have done such a good job, Mrs. Daniels did such a good job building curriculum, that our kids were, they're, they're solid, they were good when they came back because of the solid curriculum and, and services that we have to get those kids where they need to be. So um, I don't know, that's, that's what we have. Like I said, this is the cheat sheet that I always use to, to tell which one it is. Like I said, it's a little misleading because core, or like a flex time, might be a tier one intervention for one kid at the exact same time that's a tier three intervention for another kid. So um, 
You guys got any questions for me about the middle school, this this process, this system? That's a good job. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Pre-K team last year went with me to Powell for a site visit. 
they do full-on Fontas and Pinnell classroom. And the purpose of doing that is that you're not missing any element of reading. So we're not missing the comprehension, we're not missing the fluency, we're not missing the phonological awareness, the phonics, um, all the elements that go into reading. I, we, I think we were missing a few of them. And I think it's really, we're getting to the point where we're trying to fine tune that and make sure all the elements are there. So interactive read aloud focuses on comprehension. Um, they deliver that lesson and they're working on comprehension at all different DOK levels, depths of knowledge, um, from very basic questioning to very high level thinking skills. Um, with the shared reading, um, that is the teacher modeling appropriate fluency, modeling their thought process and comprehension because half the time students really struggle with comprehension because they have, they've had no one model the appropriate way to answer a question. They might have it in here, but they don't fully know how to answer it. So very excited about that. We're continuing with foundations, which is our phonics. Um, Hegarty with our K-1 kids, which is our uh, phonemic awareness. Um, all of our students are provided in I and E time, and usually I try to set up all those at the end of the day. The difference between I and E, which is provided to all students, so that's a tier one, is that during that I and E time, you might see students pulled um, by title staff, or two of the teachers are taking the majority of the students, while this teacher, teacher is taking a small group of students to possibly deliver um, an intervention on our read live naturally. So that would be a focus on our fluency. Um, they might have an additional double dip of LLI, which is our level literacy intervention um, through Fontas and Pinnell. Um, so there's a lot of elements that kind of coincide. We have I and E, but it could be used for addition. It's, it's a time provided so that any intervention that we need to deliver can be delivered during that time. Um, we also, I have built in math interventions. It's 30 minutes every Monday through Thursday um, where the grade level teams decide how they're going to group students, move students um, based upon what their needs are um, aligned to the essential learning standard at that point in time. And then there's some uh, additional social emotional tier one type of interventions, some tier two interventions and tier three interventions. Um, our tier two interventions, I was really, I, I have to share this one. I was, it kind of melted my heart a little bit. I had two, two grade levels come up to me last week and say, Katie, we know that because of closure, our first graders are really struggling with sight words. Sight words from kindergarten. Well, sight words are difficult. They are called sight words for a reason. And if you don't use them, you lose them. You know what I mean? And so our students weren't practicing those as much as they should have been over those five months. They, they have lost a few of their sight words. So they came to me and said, Is there, are you okay with us giving up one of our prep periods a day to go flood in to that grade level for three weeks and they're, they're gonna do the same for us. They're gonna come and flood into our, um, during the, our reading time or whatever it may be to help us address those gaps. Ultimately then, you have six teachers teaching this intervention versus just three and being able to get those small groups. So um, I, it was not my idea, um, but I was very proud of them. For, they're like, we, they have to be able to learn, uh, to, learn to read. It's, it's a necessity, and they're beginning with sight words. Um, and kindergarten, uh, we know, research tells us, if our students don't come to us on the second day of school knowing their letters, we're already setting them up for failure. And so they're providing that intervention for our kindergartners as well. So very excited about that. Um, something new this year is our Ames Web Progress Monitoring. And so this is, this is extremely important to us because this is ultimately what is able, allows us to qualify a student for special education through the MTSS process and we don't necessarily have to go through the full on, um, what would you say? The so, a lot of times the, our state recognizes what we call the discrepancy model. So, and it's been dubbed the wait to fail model. Because the student has to show 
so much of a discrepancy between their ability and their achievement. This lets us document what all the different things that we've tried and be able to qualify a student with a learning disability and get them the support that they need instead of waiting for the gap to get bigger. So that's, that's a it, huge piece. It is really exciting. So what we do is we put them on Ames Web and um, Stephanie Warren has done a wonderful job with this and her team with Sash Moline and Blair Alamares. On Fridays, they have designated a specific time for Ames, Ames Web Progress Monitoring. And so they begin by benchmarking the student. So say it's reading. They get a comprehension score, a fluency score, a phonics score, and there's something else. <laughs> there's a fourth score. And they're, they give them percentile rankings on all those areas, and then they give them an overall ranking. With that, the Ames Web program tells you to set go or, um, guides you through setting goals for those students. So, so, so they say, in six weeks, uh, we want this student to be scoring, scoring at this level in fluency. And it kind of tells you that's probably too high of a goal, that's not, that goal's not high enough. And then in the program we say, okay, in order, if we know they're struggling in fluency, okay, we're gonna put them in Read Live Naturally, we're gonna put that in Ames Web, and Ames Web will track for us and tell us if that specific intervention is working because they will go in every single week for, and I think it's maybe five minutes, and do a quick progress monitoring on that, and the program itself tells us if our interventions are effective or not. Hmm. And if they're not, at that point in time, we're probably to the tier three. If not, um, if we cannot, if we've not found an intervention in our systems that is effective for that child, then we can um, refer them on to special education without having to go through the discrepancy model. So, very exciting. Does anybody have any questions for me? Madam Chair, I would just like to say I think uh, I appreciate this uh, um, information from all of you. And one thing I would like to say is that I think it drives home the value of assessments. I think in the past, uh, sometimes some verbiage has been used as far as testing, that it's some arbitrary stress-induced uh, uh, you know, thing that we use, tool that's used, that uh, doesn't have a lot of value. But I think assessments is a great word because I, it's immediate uh, and it's um, intentional. And I, I can tell you, I we had uh, our third grade student. We just had uh, parent teacher conferences. Um, well, for the kindergarten student, but um, the uh, the assessments that were given at the beginning of the year, even within a matter of weeks, with those interventions applied, th there was a dramatic improvement. So, I I love that we uh, are able to see the value of assessments that is just not um, testing, but that like you said, <coughs> it's driving instruction. And I think you guys are, are the ones that are able to communicate that the best. So thank you. Madam Chair, I just add. You know, first of all, I'm very proud of the administrative team across the board for, I mean, this is no longer has, you know, we're a long ways from one or two people driving this. So it's really exciting to have a team approach to what intervention looks like. Uh, I think they've delved pretty heavily into the Mike Matos, it's about time book. Um, you know, I like that they're playing off one another. They understand the differences in those things. Just the example that Katie just gave of the discrepancy model uh, being able to circumvent that with Kristen's help, I think, is really important because, as Kristen said, we you know the the wait to fail models at two standard deviations. That that's, so, at least if, two grade levels. yeah, at least two grade levels uh, be, behind. Uh, that's been really frustrating for me to listen to as a superintendent. Like, why do we have to wait for a child to be two grade levels behind before we can intervene with them? So. They're playing off one another, which is exciting. One thing I want you to recognize as a board is as hard as they're working on academic interventions, I think it's also important for you to realize that five and a half months of being um, maybe possibly unsupervised at times, uh, uh, maybe not receiving the type of care that they all should have received, and some of those things are also creating some disciplinary uh, growth pieces that the principals are having to institute with, in, with work with their staff. And so. Just ask the board to be aware of that, that you know, those obviously aren't as public and we don't talk about those, but that's also a considerable amount of things that they are having to work on to 
uh, for lack of a better term, we kind of forgot how to go to school and do some of those things in, in places. And so there's also a heavy lift there on their part, which at some point, uh, you know, I, as a superintendent, I want to fully support them and, and, and make sure that we don't have any barriers in front of them. But I think that at some point could come to a board level as well. And so just note that some of that is being uh, worked on, uh, like I say, maybe not as much in the spotlight, but it's it's also, there's gaps there that we're trying to overcome as well. So uh, just to appreciate their work, appreciate their, um, what they're able to share with you and their growth and knowledge you know, overall as a team with all that they're doing with the intervention. Mr. Chair, I have a question. Um, so this is Ray. Um, within your room, how did you guys do? I think you know that was some of the concern we had going into the time where we were out of school that your group might suffer the most because they were the most needy. Were you guys able to weather the storm as well as some of the other buildings and uh, you know come out of that okay? Or how do you? I smile because I anticipated that you might ask. Um, one of the things that I do want to share with you is that our students on IEPs fit into these tiers as well. They not only receive their specialized instruction, but oftentimes they are the ones receiving those exact uh, same interventions across the buildings. Um, for our, when we started looking when we came back about, well, do we start fixing their IEPs and adding in more minutes? Our district took a much more conservative approach. Um, which I think has benefited us. Uh, we, some districts jumped right in and said, oh, we're gonna offer students this and this and this and see if that helps them come back. But when you do that, you're recognizing that you're probably pulling them back out of classroom instruction even more to provide that. And you don't even have grounds to fully understand, did they lose that much skill? Mm -hmm. um, so something that I've been talking with our teachers about is that natural rec recoupment. And I've been trying to dissect our data uh, to do a comparison, which I'm hoping to have ready for you next month, is what does the learning loss for our students with disabilities look like compared to just our general population of students um, across grade levels, across, across content areas. And this is kind of a shout out to our middle school model PLC feedback, um, which I think Dustin, you're gonna share with them. They had said that our district, um, it's really nice to see that we are finding data to use to uh, look at these like gap or the gaps that students might have because a lot of districts are just simply saying we didn't have a statewide assessment we don't have any data we don't know where they are mm -hmm. so it just is taking me a little bit more time to go across and crunch those numbers from what I've observed so far and talked with our teachers it's not super alarming mm -hmm. so I, I will have more information for you next month um, I have done my research when I said we've we've taken a conservative approach. If we were to offer more services, the state has dubbed those COVID-19 recovery services, uh, similar to compensatory education. We don't feel like they got what they needed, we're going to offer more. But again, that, that requires them to be pulled out of the classroom. Mm -hmm. so. <coughs> yeah. Madam Chair, I'm just gonna read this because I think it probably should be public, if you don't mind. Dear Principal Soderstrom, congratulations. We've just finished reviewing your data update for your model PLC status. We continue to be impressed by the collaborative practices that you put in place. It's clear that you're doing the right work on behalf of students. We're proud to continue your model PLC status. What impressed us the most was your thorough description of the data that you're using to monitor student progress through the COVID-19 shutdown. We've seen several schools applying for or working to update their model PLC status who are struggling to share data for last year given the school shutdown. Your application will be a perfect model for them to find the kind of evidence that should be available to them if they've been tracking progress carefully throughout the school year. Thank you for your continued efforts on behalf of your students and for continuing to serve as a model for other schools who are working towards the same goals. We're genuinely proud of you. Till then, the Evidence Effectiveness Committee. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So <coughs> I think that uh, just needs to be shared publicly. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Uh, Chair. Yes, um, I just appreciate the consistency between all the buildings. Uh, in years past, you know, we've had this one's doing this, this one's doing that, and, you know, the, the information that gets provided to, to us at that time was kind of hard to follow. 
it's easy to follow this and you know that you're all using the same model and, and you're working together to build it all together to me it really shows it is uh, and I think I even said it before it's truly becoming more of a k-12 system and not individual buildings trying to work um, you know through their own problems or, or issues or anything like that y'all are definitely working as a, as a k-12 system and you know I I've seen the growth from our administrative team over the years even through the gap that I wasn't on the board you can still see the growth and you know I really do appreciate everybody's efforts into that and, and bring it to where it is today mm -hmm. Thank you, principals, no, for sharing sure. with us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Norsworthy. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, consent agenda. Is there anything that we need to pull? Okay. Stand. Let's move on to old business. Uh, policy <coughs> revisions. Madam Chair, second and final reading on several here. Uh, GC, I won't read them all. You guys can read them. Can, can I get a motion? Uh, Madam Chair, I move that we approve on second and final reading to the following policies. GCCA dash GDCR uh, DKC dash uh, E1 <laughs> DKC dash E2 and ADD and J LG. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. Any discussion? Yes, Madam Chair, on GCCA-R, I just wondered why membership is strictly voluntary, is lined out. Is it mandatory now? Okay. Yeah, so Madam Chair, Rick, uh, we just without getting too far into personal issues with the folks, we've been in a situation or two where we're talking about complete financial collapse of somebody who ends up with a, a serious disease and we just are going to offer it as a, uh, a benefit that you get when you come to the district rather than you can opt to be in you know just mm -hmm. a lot of times that's a young person who may not view themselves as a possibility of getting seriously ill and that so it's just going to be a benefit that we offer you know it's one day and then that's one day later if you if we actually use those up so we're just making that part of our benefits package. Okay, because so. I must have missed it on first reading because I didn't catch that. I missed yeah, it. yeah. So just yeah. so sorry about that, Rick. But no, that's no just problem. a. Uh, we're just going to offer it as a benefit to avoid the um, having to break policy in a really bad situation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? And. Motion carries. Next, consider for approval, second, and final reading of revised salary schedule. Madam Chair, I move that we approve on the second reading uh, the proposed salary schedule for non teaching contracts 21 22, proposed uh, for coaches 2021 22, and for classified 21 22. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All right, moving on to new business. Policy review. Madam Chair, with GA, GBA, GBB, and GBD, no uh, changes recommended. Okay. Madam Chair, I did have a question on one. Let me figure out which one it was. It was just the title of it, and trying to read through it, I just wondered if there needed to be a rewording. Um, if it was this one or a different one. Okay, uh, so it's uh, policy GA, personnel policies and goals. Just the title of it that's in bold, that first full sentence there, uh, or there was part of that that I had trouble with just kind of grasping what it was trying to say. 
So the policies relating to personnel in this manual are intended as a guide for the efficient and professional any employee as containing binding terms. That part right there were professional any employee as containing binding terms. I was just trying to grasp the, it didn't seem clear to me, and, and I just wasn't sure what it was trying to say. I think it's trying to say is after you get hired and we change something, they still have to abide by it. That's how I read it, is it? Yeah, and I think it should say professionalism. Yeah. Okay. I, I, there Not was something that was off. I think, it, I just I think, I think it, it should say professionalism. I think you're correct there, Joe. Okay. I might recommend that change, I would say. Policy revisions. Madam Chair, all of these are recommendations from legal counsel. Okay. Madam Chair, I move to approve on first reading uh, policy ACA, policy AC R, and policy AC. I'll second, second. that. Got to be with you guys. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Jane, do you have a paper copy? I do. I do. It just doesn't have all the. Okay. So we had a motion and a second. Any discussion? Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Carries. Moving on uh, to review the strategic plan. Uh, item C. Madam Chair, appointing Oh, WSB. I'm sorry, I skipped. Thank sorry. you. Um, consider for approval and appoint a member to act as the WSBA voting delegate. Is there anyone who wants that position? So I can't do that because I'm already on WSBA, but um, from the looks of things, that might be virtual. Yeah. Okay. So when is the, the virtual conference again? It's the same time it yeah. was before. So the I don't have the date. Week before me. Thanksgiving. It is. Yeah. So the whole week of the 15th, 17th, yeah, somewhere, yeah. Right in the 19th. somewhere right in there. Okay. And and Madam Chair Brian had said possibility, obviously, that we won't be online all day, um, but that it could be a shortened yeah. version. Just a few hours yeah. each day, it looks yeah. like, just to keep people's attention. We're keeping the guest speakers and legal the legal update because that's the most popular um, of all the things, and then the delegate assembly, and that's about it. It's just going to be so a very short. call for presentations or anything, correct? Mm -hmm. right. They so will do the Golden Bell and yeah. you know a few of the awards at the end. So the voting delegate would um, same thing as always, just online. Online. Mm -hmm. So even if and it'll only last an hour, probably yeah. would be my guess. Mm -hmm. I'd be willing to do it again. Would you? Okay. So do we need to? Nominate him or just all shake our head and I say, think You just appoint him. All right, Joe, I appoint you. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. All right, thank you, Joe. All right, now we're moving on to the review of the strategic plan for the 2021 20, school year, which I don't have in front of me. So, sorry, Madam Chair. Uh, no, it's um, okay. So, but just, just FYI for the board, we've continued with this format. Uh, we did have them color code so you could see the differences in buildings. I, I want you to recognize that a lot of this work is just, it's not fluff. It is just what you're hearing they're doing. And that's really what a strategic plan should be. You know, like that we should be working on the work mm -hmm. and not throwing darts at a dartboard to make it sound really good. And so it is, it's, I would say it's a little more brief than it's been in recent years. And so like, if I can give an example, so each of the admin I'm going to work with this fall, they'll have 
a growth goal that's more of their evaluative piece than their evaluation because they're coming out of COVID-19. It's like, do I really need to add a bunch of other things for them to be thinking about going forward into just getting school started back into what school is, knowing that we could have several curveballs. So this is a this is a trimmed down version, but that it's on purpose that way. So I don't know if anybody noticed that, but it is it's fairly what we're doing. It's good. I actually I appreciated the trimmed down version. <laughs> it made it. Uh, simple to follow and understand it, so it, as always it can be flexible madam chair if we get into the middle of the year we see a tremendous need in an area we can uh, work on that but uh, right now these are the the action steps that the admin is taking anyone have any comments about it any questions i personally think this is the best format that you guys have had you know, in the past, some of it's a little bit confusing, hard to follow, some of the timeline pieces, but I think anybody can pick this up and look at it and realize what, our, what we're doing. And I really like the breakout from the different buildings because I think, you know, you guys are attacking things a little differently depending on what's going on in your building. So, uh, you know, I, I honestly think this is a superior document to what we've seen in the past. So great job, everybody, in regards to that. I think it's an outstanding document. And, you know, just further you know, setting what you guys are trying to accomplish. So, good job. I concur. Anyone Not else? sure it's up for discussion, but you can accept it if you'd like. Oh. Or you can do that in November, or you can do it this month. We just put it on there as review, and then if you'd like to, you can accept it. I would accept a motion. I if would move to accept the uh, strategic plan as presented. I'll second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. All opposed? All right, moving on. Consider for approval change to the classified salaries. Now, Chair, tremendous amount of work put into this by Kathy, and I'm excited about uh, the breakdown that this is for, uh, again, um, the new column uh, that you would see is for student workers in A. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and one thing we've done here is there has been a desire for possibly lights on to be able to pay <coughs> more than that initial um, step one uh, if they can afford that in their grant. However, like for our kids that are working uh, in our daycare, our daycare is currently working on reducing uh, you know like what our subsidy would be so they really can't afford to do that so this gives us flexibility in that column to the place wherever um, each each entity would uh, department would want to place them so why would we need 27 because I don't know many students that yeah I'm thinking the same well, if, if we change change. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Old hopefully we've graduated a yeah. <laughs> couple there are some <laughs> that is, a, we, we will have that fixed next year. Okay, so do we need a motion. Madam Chair, I move that we accept the proposed changes to the salary schedule for classified staff for 2020 to 2021. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All right. Let's move on to conflict of interest discussion. Policy discussion. Madam Chair, we have you two proposals, but you're obviously not tied to that as a board for this discussion. It's well, just, I could not remember what our third was. So before we start discussion, um, what I'd like to do is see if I even have a motion. Because if we don't have a motion for a change, there's no reason to discuss. Okay. Okay. It should be Joe's motion. So, Madam Chair, I would move to approve um, board member conflict of interest as policy BCB with the, I guess that's the second change, or that's proposal number one um, that states no relative of an employee will be shown a preference for employment in any position. No board member shall advocate or cause the employment appointment 
promotion, transfer, or advancement of a family member, spouse, parent, sibling, child, grandparent, or grandchild to an office or position with the school district, nor shall any board member participate in his official capacity as a board member regarding a matter relating to the employment or discipline of a family member. Okay, it's been moved. Do I have a second? I'll second that for discussion. Okay, now we're open for discussion. Uh, Madam Chair, the reason I chose this one over the other policy proposal number two was I think just a little bit more of the clarity of what it is that we're trying to prevent uh, from happening and I, I think it one it does open it up a little bit more for some of the things that uh, some other board members have had concerns about but I think the way that it's stated um, I mean it, it clarifies really in there the, the responsibility of the particular board member who has a conflict, you know, that they need to recuse themselves essentially. Mm -hmm. um, I, so I think it provides that additional information, whereas with proposal number two, just adding to a certified administrative full-time classifier to coaching position, it doesn't really, you know, clarify more so that as a board member, this is your responsibility to recuse yourself. Okay. Anyone else want to? My concern to that one is how, you know, yeah, you recuse yourself on the vote, but how do you, how does the public know you, you actually did step away from the situation? I mean, that would be my concern because that, you know, that we, it's how we look. Mm -hmm. It's a valid concern, and I think with that, you know, now that we have more visibility through, you know, the YouTube, that I think it really shows more people are able to see, you know, what we're doing and how we're doing it. And that it's not just, and, and I think we need to hold ourselves accountable to it, that if somebody is going to abstain from a vote and recuse themselves, then we need to hold them to what our policy says and they need to remove themselves from the boardroom so that that way that, you know, doesn't show the undue influence. If this is oh, oh, go ahead. Well, so I, you know, my thoughts are that you know it's not so much that what what we might do in here as a board in front of the public, but it's it's the it's the pressure that's applied in every situation that has nothing to do even with the uh, with the the family member that's working for the district. You know what I mean? So if I'm if I'm upset about the way a family member was treated, then I'm going to apply that to another situation that has nothing to do with it, and that's the that's the part that that has some real potential to cause some problems, you know. And and it's also the the pressure that's applied to an administrator when they're considering hiring somebody. It's like, okay, now I know this person's not going to get involved. They probably wouldn't say one word of like advocating for, but you know, there's those personalities that. Where like if that person is not hired, that board member is not going to forget it. Now that's the part that I I don't like. But and and you know from my own you know I think everybody knows how I feel about it you know so I'm not going to say a whole lot but um, you know I like it the way it is because you know right now it's it's not part of the the interference or the noise that's involved with decision making. You know there's all kinds of different you know you're pulled in a lot of different ways you know. And, and having a family member there, it, you know, are we making the best decision based upon what's best for the community, which is what's best for, you know, teachers, students, and the whole nine yards, or are we make, am I going to make a decision based upon what's best for a family member, you know, so that's what, I just, I like the fact that I don't have to even think about it, and, and I know that there are those situations already, you know, and, and, and that, that, that potential is, is could be in the future too, you know. But I, I also know that, you know, looking on the bright side, you know, if we did this change, we might find the best employee we've ever found, you know. But, but I still think that, for me, I would like to hold the course, you know. Madam Chair, I just have a question. I wasn't uh, involved in the previous discussion, so 
Clay, for clarification, are you looking at uh, policy one, the stuff, leave it, the stuff that's in red and not the data, right. the stuff that's in blue? I would say just leave the policy as is. Don't, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's what I would say. The motion that's on the table right. is... For the group. Right. And yes. Yes. Right. yes. I get that. I'm just asking what he was... Oh, right. okay. What yeah. his yeah. stand was, just for clarification. Is there anybody on the board that likes policy two? I personally, if I was going to vote for a change, I would like policy two because, mm -hmm. I mean, because a, a non full time certified, not you know, class, yeah. classified, or you're looking at bus drivers, you're looking at um, cooks, you're looking at custodians, those really hard to fill positions, and they don't aren't looked upon as anything like with power in the district, let's say. You know, I, I don't know a better term than power. The so least controversial. Least position. controversial. Thank you. I, I think that's how I would term yeah, it. Yeah, that's a better better way to term that. So, if we were going to change the policy, one of these two, I I like policy two better. Can you read that for me, please? I'll just read that one. I'll just paragraph. read that one paragraph. The board will not initially employ any person who is a spouse or a close relative by blood or marriage of the superintendent or any member of the board to a certified administrative full-time classified or coaching position. If the close relative, as defined above, is already employed by the district at the time the board member is elected or superintendent is hired, the employee will be allowed to maintain his or her employment status with the district. So basically, it's just saying that they could go ahead and interview for classified positions. Non-full-time classified positions. Okay. And Madam Chair, if I remember correctly in our discussion before, this did seem like it lended itself more to the seasonal positions that were uh, historically maybe have had a harder time filling those positions. Is that right? And, you know, personally, I, I would be okay with either one of these uh, policies, to tell you the truth, changes. I just feel more comfortable with um, proposal number one. Um, yes. Madam Chair, the other thing I was thinking about in, I, I probably like uh, the one that you just read better than the other one, but we're talking about where the changes that are made, it says to a certified person, administration, full-time classified, or coaching position, but I'm almost wondering if that should just be the head coaching position, not the assistants, because in all the rest of them, they're it's like the top position, but then in coaching, we're using a blanket statement for all coaches. Good point. And, and part of me is like, they're not in charge of the whole team. They're, they would be an assistant coach. And, you know, we've had that issue within our board and missed out on some great assistant coaches because of that. So I'm kind of wondering if that should just be a head coach position. Madam Chair, and I, I know there's a motion on the floor, but for the purpose of discussion, um, I I agree with Clay in the sense of we've avoided a lot of sticky situations with our current uh, policy, and I think it leaves it pretty clear. If there is going to be a change to allow for what Sherman's talking about, some of those more difficult uh, positions and understanding our the pool of opportunity from which we're drawing is small and being a business owner in the past and you know struggling with that I think we do limit ourselves I would wonder why can't we use the language that Joe likes which it doesn't talk about anything about what you can or can't be in but it uh, outlines the responsibility that a board member mm -hmm. in that situation would have which I think is good mm -hmm. but couple it with the portion of two which outlines the, the positions that I don't think we should uh, allow if we're going to allow somebody uh, to do to be. So I would actually like to take the blue in one, couple it with two because it outlines the responsibility if we're going to have a situation that you need to withhold yourself to, but it also limits getting sticky because if Clay's son comes back and he's going to be a you know a principal and that you know I like clay and it's going to affect my relationship if I don't end up voting for that and so some of the pressure that he's talking about is not the pressure necessarily that is seen or you know voiced here but it's some of those secondary pressures just by 
you know, uh, working relationship or friendship or, you know, some of the professionalism, those standards that we have. And so I, I would, I would uh, like, if we're going to do a change, I would like to have the blue from policy one and policy two. Mm -hmm. And because of it's two different pieces. And I like Nicole's piece as well because, again, I think there's situations where some of our, you know, situations in a small town, you're going to lose opportunity, mm -hmm. and I think that that cleans that up a lot. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm going to vote against Joe's um, uh, his motion, motion, and then I'm going to present something we different. Can, we can that. amend the motion too, or I can amend it if Joe would like. So I would like to amend the motion to have the blue section. Charles, uh, just a second. Could, could we just have one little bit more piece of discussion before you make your amendment? I, I, I sure. agree with you on that. But I would say that, you know, if we're going to make a change, I, I think also limiting, you know, full-time classified positions, I mm -hmm. think that's a mistake. Because, I do too. You know, those, you know, the bus drivers, that's some of the hardest positions to mm -hmm. fill. Is that a full-time class? Just, just a not couple. Full -time. Just but a that couple. would be like a para. Yeah. Like I think it should just be administration and certified professionals like the head coaches and our certified teachers. I don't disagree. You know, uh, our certified positions. I don't disagree. Okay. I mean, yeah. because then cooks and right, you know, right. some of those yeah. are not going to be as controversial because exactly. the other ones are they're controversial positions. Yeah. And yeah. They carry a lot more emotion mm -hmm. uh, and tie from the kids and adults and, mm -hmm. and things like that. So yeah. So I I don't have a problem with that. Madam yeah. Chair, Just add that to you. for a cleaner process, um, I will rescind my motion. Okay. So yeah. Madam Chair, then I would move that we um, accept the change to the policy from the proposed policy one and two to include the language from policy number one that's in blue outlining the responsibility of board members that are in a situation there, adding with it the portion from policy example two that states of the board to a certified administrative and head coaching position. Mm -hmm. I like that wording. I'll second. Yeah, moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Madam Chair, I don't want to throw, did. I don't want to throw a wrench in this <laughs> <laughs> because I like where you're going with it, but we're going to have to clean that up a little bit because assistant coaches are certified. Hmm. PTSB. So, if you can clean that up for uh, me, I'm good. good. <clears throat> so, certified teacher, administrative, full time, or just head. But if you, I just said head coaching. So if you said certified teacher, teacher, administrative position, or full time. Head coach. And the yeah, reason, but what about the like there's uh, like speech pad, yeah, and I was just other certified that. nurse, and mm -hmm. so that's why we use just use the term certified period because there's teaching and non-teaching certified. So we could say certified teaching and non-teaching okay. minus. Yeah. Uh, so we yeah, you could just put excluding. Yeah, I was going to say assistant coaches. Okay. Yeah, well, good. and I think that that's getting pretty technical because the I just don't want it to come up later. Well, I know. No, no, it's a good discussion point, but the certification for a, an assistant coach is much different than the certification yep. for a speech therapist or a teacher sure. or a, I mean it's a certification yeah. though. It is. I, just, I just I just don't want somebody yeah. down the road to say they can't do it. Yeah. If you, if you want them to be able to. Yeah. Or because you know that if they're both going if they're all going through PTSD, it doesn't yeah. really yeah. That's just all I'm worried about. I think about. if you just put excluding assistant, assistant coaches, okay. that's the easiest way That'd to. That'd be fine. Would okay. that, does that wording work yep. for you, Mr. Hunt? Yep. So I'll, I'll make that change uh, as stated. So to a certified position, administrative position, or a full time coach, head coach, excluding assistant coach, type coaches. Yep. We could do that. Moved, seconded. Man, that was a really good discussion. Mm -hmm. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Aye.
I'm still opposed, but I'm going to back the board 100%. But, but this comes back next month, right? Because it's yes, change. yes, we, we have time. Okay, <laughs> this was just nice. Okay, all right, moving on. Can I get a motion to adjourn to executive session? Motion to adjourn to exec. Second. Discuss we'll, just be right. we'll just be right here. Second. Second. Oh, we're just staying right here? Yeah. You guys can. Oh, you guys have to. So we can. Bathroom breaks. Yes.